straight on with Simon Colton. So Simon is a chair in an ERA chair in digital news technology at Falmouth University and he's also professor of computational creativity at the Department of Computing at Copestance College and University of London. Yes, wonderful to be here. Um, I am a scientist, um, so it's nice to see at uh, events um, in humanities. Um, I was asked to prepare a 15 minute talk, um, so uh, but it's a bit longer, so I'll, uh, I'll take my time a bit and perhaps give our resident artists uh, a chance so if you want to go fast with the slides. Uh, and this being guerrilla science, um, please feel free to attack me from the hills or from the forest <laughs> at any stage, um, or save your questions to the end, of course. Uh, I'm here representing the field of computational creativity, the subfield of artificial intelligence, um, and uh, this is a working definition that Garen Wooden and I put together a few years ago. Um, we would say the philosophy, science, and engineering of computational systems, which, by taking on particular responsibilities, exhibit behaviours that unbiased observers would deem to be creative. So the unbiased observers there is a, a nod to the fact that there can be something we call silicon bias. The, the idea that just because it's software it can't be created um, can uh, bias observers in their, in their, uh, if we do studies with them. Uh, I'm really interested in the particular responsibilities part of it. Um, I'm very much a practical guy. I write software and the software is creative um, or not, depending on your point of view. But it generates stuff, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit today. Um, as a field, we have kind of three main challenges, uh, depending on who we're speaking to. Um, I'm very much interested in the top one, building autonomous and creative systems. Other people uh, think of computational creativity as just another tool, or the latest tool in the philosopher's toolbox to study human creativity. Um, and then there's a middle ground, really, of um, computational, computational creativity support tools which help people to be more creative by itself of being a muse or a tool um, or a uh, collaborator. We interact with cognitive sciences and philosophy, um, artificial intelligence and other computational sciences, of course, um, and we also overlap with cultural domains, uh, music art, design, math, science, games, poetry, stories, and recently recipes. Um, there's software out there which will make recipes and we've had dinner parties where nobody died, it's about the best you can say of them. And we try and put on art exhibitions, produce print, scientific publications of the software generated science, um, and recently put on dinner parties and musicals, um, which I'll come to in a second. And we try and get out there and work with companies. Not nearly enough uh, as we'd like to, um, but we're beginning to break into the creative industries. Advertising in particular is interesting that in our field now. So by way of credentials, I'm just going to go through very quickly some of the projects that I've been involved with over the last 10 or 15 years um, to show you that I've really kind of been there and done it on the practical side of computational creativity. So I'm a trained mathematician by trade, uh, and so my entry into the field is getting software to be creative in pure mathematics. Um, you can be relieved to know I'm not going to go through this theorem line by line, but this is a, a proof of theorem about um, classification of quasi-groups of order 4. Um, mathematicians might uh, understand that, but most people are probably don't. Um, so my first software called uh, HR, after Hardy and Amnujan, um, two famous mathematicians, um, went out there and invented mathematical concepts like these ones here, um, and combinations thereof, uh, and uh, I wrote hundreds of one, dozens of papers uh, on that. Um, but there's not time to go into that today, but that was my answer to the film. I'm probably more well known these days um, for work in the visual arts, I have software called Painting Fool at paintingfool.com. Um, and the stated aim of this project is for the software to be taken seriously as a creative artist in its own right one day. And I joke in a not entirely joking way that um, one day I will die and the software will carry on creating art in interesting ways and no one will notice that I've died. I really do want the software to be taken seriously as an artist. Um, and that's involved me doing all sorts of public engagement uh, with the software. So this is what I would call a weak computational creativity project um, uh, with a weak aim of producing artifacts of awe and beauty for kind of gallery exhibitions. Um, there you're really interested in the quality of the artifact and so therefore you might step in as a creative person and tailor the process, curate 
um, change the program until you get something that you like. This piece is called The Dance Conservant Problem. Uh, it was part of an exhibition called No Photo Card. I wanted to get people away from the idea that computer art is just two things. Pretty, pretty, abstract, fractal-like art with no uh, figurative elements, or photoshopped uh, images, somehow starting with photographs as the base point. This is neither of those. Um, it's clearly figurative, so it's not entirely abstract, um, but these images of people dancing were not produced from photographs they're produced on something called a uh, context-free design grammar. So they generated uh, images of people, and then the painting gets put on top of that. Uh, so this is neither abstract art nor um, photograph-based art. So that's the painting for. And I go out there and for a more strong project, um, I get a subway to paint live and to talk about its process as well, to, to write about its process. So this is on stage with um, Laura Green, Telly Guy. Uh, and uh, the idea there was, and this big screen in the background, the software painted his portrait live while he interviewed me. Uh, and until it's not a, a weak aim there, because it's such a terrible portrait, and it painted him a bit like a walrus, uh, which he pointed out. Um, the point there was that it was appropriate in that sense. This is a New Scientist Live event um, a couple of months ago, 500 people back here. Uh, and uh, the idea there was that the software was being created live. Uh, and I was talking about it. Normally the software tells you about its process. It tells you what mood it was in because it's reading a newspaper. It uses that mood to take its artistic process and it uses a lot of machine vision to work out whether it's achieved the mood that it turned. Uh, it achieved a picture which might reflect the mood that it was in at the time. Um, I don't have much time to go into that, I'm afraid, but um, we take us around the country. This is a three day exhibition at the Science Museum um, with about 300 children having their portraits painted over uh, three days and one night. Um, and as you see, the actual look of the software, a hand appears on the screen and starts painting. Uh, so you get to see the paint process. It's not like Photoshop, uh, in the sense of Photoshop is instant. Um, this is a, a more visual, slow process. I've also worked in poetry. Um, not a major area for me, um, but I, it's altered my perception of context creativity. I now advocate talking about sea poems rather than poems. Um, the same way as if I told you I bought you a wonderful e-book for Christmas, you wouldn't expect to unwrap a beautiful bound leather volume, uh, you'd expect to download something for your Kindle. I think we should call these things sea poems because you're not going to get a connection with a human author through them because there was no human author. Um, however, you can get other things from them. Um, so I also think that sea poems need to be a doublet. Uh, a poem shaped piece of text and an explanation of where that text came from. Um, I don't have time, I won't read it out either, um, but there's a, there's a lovely line there which always, um, always uh, puts the hair up in the back of my neck um, when I you know, read it out. Um, so that was about on the, on the radio. Uh, the most recent project was fictional ideation, and I mentioned this in, in the question um, uh, that uh, I asked Maggie. Uh, this has just ended, I was in Brussels yesterday, uh, and they had a final review for this, and it got good reviews, so that's good. Um, and we get ideas out of this what if machine, like what if the fish got drunk? What if there was a lawyer who worked on an island with a cat that could still talk? Um, kind of Kafka S point. Um, this is my favourite <coughs> time. What if there was an old dog who couldn't run anymore, which he used to do for fun, so instead learned how to ride a horse? So these are not randomly constructed and highly curated. You don't have to generate 10,000 of these to find uh, four cherries to pick. Um, the software knows that um, old dogs can't do things anymore that dogs do run, that dogs run for enjoyment, some of them, um, and something else to do for enjoyment is to ride a horse. That's also a locomotive action. Um, so there are, uh, it's an intelligently constructed uh, what if. So it knows a little bit more about it than just the text. Um, and this is now my favorite. Uh, what if there was a poor boy who was born with a horn, which made great communication, um, and he went to become a famous slave. I like this because it has a touch of the Gabriel Garcia Marquez magical realism in there, being born with a horn. Uh, although it's, I, uh, it's lovely, it's nice to be interpreted this as well. I was always thinking this is a boy born with an actual deformation of the head with a horn. Other people think that they're born with a French horn in their hands, uh, or a, you know, a horn to blow. Um, so it's, there's a nice choice there. And there's a choice, of course, born poor, but I'm um, going to be famous for a famous slave. Um, so, uh, there's a, there you can imagine a short story. That's the whole point of this project, is to have the, the wallet machine online there uh, being used by people for short stories uh, and for other purposes. Uh, and to that end, we had a lot of success in the middle of the project. 
with a musical theatre production. And so we pushed hard for our software. Wingspan Productions, the TV company, came to us saying we want to put on the world's first computer generated musical. And we pushed hard for the original concept to be generated by the Walt Disney machine. And eventually we got there. And the software came out with what if there was a wounded soldier who had to learn how to understand a child in order to find true love? Um, and you can't quite see it, but the What If Machine is credited there with the original concept. <coughs> this guy comes on stage on the musical and starts rubbing his leg because he's a wounded soldier because our software suggested that. Um, and there's a whole project going around that, a Sky Art documentary about this, which you can um, buy for 30 euros, no, 30 dollars, 30 pounds, sorry, it's not sure uh, online if you want to, I don't get any profits from that, so uh, I'm not selling it too hard. Um, and uh, ultimately we showed that there's some cultural value to the What If. Um, a West End musical for two weeks here in London at the Arts Theatre, um, and too much playing, and lots of uh, criticism as well. Uh, the most recent stuff, which is what I'm doing down in Falmouth, um, is uh, video games work, this is Gamma Technologies. So the idea here is that it's still very difficult to make a video game. Um, you need programming skills, you need art, you need music. You need to be very, very skilled in various areas. Um, and we've written software and which enables you to make games right there on your iPhone with your left thumb in minutes, rather than spending a three-year degree course learning how to make games and then making games. Um, and if you're interested in this, um, we can give you an app um, called No Second Chance. Uh, whereby you can make games uh, yourself. And the software generates games. Up here is the software generated four games. It's automatically playing them itself, see which ones are the best, and then it gives the best ones to the user, and the user can then change them uh, if they want to, or start again. So please talk to me about that. I'm also in video games now. And finally, the most recent stuff is going back to the mathematics. Um, this is at the top of my mind right now. I was doing this on the train on the way in today. Uh, and I've invented a new form of puzzle called Dynasty. Then if you like the countdown numbers game, then this is kind of a potted version of it and more enjoyable by far. Um, but again, I don't have time to talk about this, um, but um, computationally aided by my old math software to invent these new types of puzzle. So, a whirlwind tour of 20 years of work in the practical side, um, and there's lots more. And actually, this is just a project that I've coded for directly and helped with the coding for. Um, there's uh, dozens and dozens of others in the field of computational activity, so please ask me if you're interested in that. We're doing everything from recipes to puzzle. Um, so this overview of, of being a kind of jack of none of these trades, never even, not even a master, has given me an overview of, of creativity from a computational perspective, which makes me able to tentatively step into the field of talking about human creativity. Hence the title of the talk, Computational Creativity in Humanity. Um, and it's enabled me to have a uh, philosophical perspective myself on creativity. So I'll read this out. So we hold that um, creativity is a secondary and essentially contested quality of a person or a program, a computer program, uh, which is conveyed by declarative elocutionary acts. So that needs a bit of unpacking. Um, I think creativity is secondary because it's just not intrinsic uh, in people. There's no creativity bone, there's no creativity organ or gene or chromosome. Um, it's just what we project onto others. So when the whole world projects creativity onto a person like Picasso or Einstein, then that person can be creative. But you don't need the whole world to do it. If Nicholas Sorota, now head of the Arts Council, ex head of the Tate, um, says, I think you are a creative person, you become creative for that moment, albeit temporarily. Um, just like I pronounce you husband and wife by a priest. Um, that's a declarative dictionary act part. Now this is a really interesting part. Um, this might annoy some of you because it feels like I'm dodging a bullet here. Um, so it's essentially contested. Essentially contested concepts um, are such are concepts which we have agreed to disagree about forever. And I think our art is obviously one of those, and creativity should be, um, and certainly is one of those. And I just want to unpack that further because I love this paragraph uh, that we put together in a paper. So uh, Gabby introduces back in 1954, uh, essentially contested concepts are those for which the proper use inevitably involves endless disputes about the proper uses on the part of their users. Um, to which Gray added that the disputes cannot be settled by appeal to empirical evidence, linguistic usage, or the kinds of, uh, kinds of logic alone. And Smith noted that all argued that the concept is being used inappropriately by others. Um, if you look in books like The Cambridge Handbook for Creativity, um, they say things like, despite the abundance of definitions, um, very few of those different definitions are widely used, uh, and many researchers simply avoid using them. 
Um, so essentially my view is that we have agreed to disagree about creativity forever because that's a good thing for society. You know, what would happen to the world if we all began to agree what was and what wasn't creative? It's a driving force for progress in society. So if you were expect, I'm a scientist, and this scares it to me to death, of course. I, most people ask me at some stage, what's your definition of creativity? And I have to say, um, sorry, this is not going to happen. We're never going to get there, no matter how complicated. Because we shouldn't be asking that question. So I don't believe that creativity um, is something we should be uh, defining. Albeit there are all sorts of things like Maggie's uh, novelty, usefulness and so forth and surprisingness. These are things which are kind of mainstays in the discussion about creativity. But ultimately if we're not arguing about creativity then we're not really talking about creativity. Which is quite a shocking thing for scientists to be, uh, to be involved with. Um, but so again, yeah, it's actually very exciting having this um, moving target. So I'm going to end by coming back to the humanity with uh, quite a famous poem by Maureen Smith um, on childbirth. Um, the point of this will become clear. It's a, it's a short poem but um, packs a punch. It goes, um, the joy, the pain, the begin again, my boy, born of me, for me, through my tears, through my fears. So, um, you can read poems however you want, of course, that's the beauty of them. Um, one thing you might like to do is interpret um, what uh, Maureen was trying to say with this. Um, and you might think um, that um, she's talking about her own childbirth experience, um, talking about my boy there. Um, the begin again, that's a literal beginning for the child, maybe a rebirth or a starting over for the whole family. Um, born of me, for me, or literal in this case. Uh, and probably the tears are tears of joy and, and pain um, in childbirth. And of course fears, fears could be interpreted there as fears for uh, the actual process of giving birth or fears for the future. Um, and so there's a nice interpretation there. Uh, oh, oh, actually, I'm oh, sorry, I made, made a mistake. Um, this is actually uh, by Morris Q. Smith. Uh, so we might need to reinterpret that. Sorry about that. So maybe here um, he's talking about uh, being in the room when his wife uh, or partner gave birth. Uh, maybe the tears are more tears of joy than pain in this case. Um, and the fears maybe for his partner or for the baby. Um, one thing you might need to know about Morris Q. Smith um, was that unfortunately he was uh, serving 25 years in one with prison when he wrote this. He was a child in Leicester. Um, and it caused controversy when it was published um, because ultimately phrases like my boy, born for me, um, fears and tears, it was widely interpreted as being about grooming boys um, for his pedophilia uh, interests. Um, so it's a kind of horrible uh, actual backstory to that. But you may have guessed it, um, I've been lying to you all along. This was actually written by a piece of software, Morris Q. Pot. Thank God for that. There is no Morris Q. Um, so we might want to reinterpret this now. So maybe the software was talking, well, when he talked about tears, maybe the software was talking about, well, forget tears. Okay, what about the joy and the pain? So the software was presumably talking there about. Well, actually, I've got no idea what the stuff we're talking about when it produces it. Um, and this is a big problem we have in computational creativity. And I'm using this example to really beat my colleagues with and really upset a lot of people in my field um, because I think um, this is a limiting factor for computational creativity, potentially. Um, and just for the record, I've been lying again. I wrote this on a train a, a few weeks ago. And I chose it specifically to have multiple interpretations, one of them very wholesome about childbirth and one of them very unwholesome about grooming children for paedophilia. Um, so that is the truth finally. Um, and I need it to point out that we lose this lovely interpretation ability. And I can argue with you all day about um, intentional fallacy and death of the author. And I do worry whether they, they, those wonderful maxims still hold uh, in the age of computational poetry. Because this has been my impression anecdotally. So I should point out the scientist to me is, is screaming, you've not done this experiment. I haven't done this experiment. But I've had lots of times when I've read these poems out in poetry. <coughs> I, do, I do poetry readings as well. Um, and what I find is that when you ask people to appreciate that poem, or those, the computer generated poems, I should say, um, they seem compelled to project humanity onto the author. So the BBC were given, uh, gave some of my poems, or the software poems, to some professors of poetry in Manchester. And the first thing they said was, well, it was written by one of my students. And I went, but it wasn't written by one of your students. 
Well, it was written by an amateur, and I keep going, no, it wasn't written by an amateur, or oh, was it written by a child? They, they, they found it very difficult, even given information about what the software did, and its motivations, and the intelligent AI systems beneath it, they still had a hard time appreciating it. What, what on earth does it mean for software to write about childbirth? You lose all of this backstory. And here's the thing, uh, if computer-generated poems have to be read as if they were written by a person, well, why don't we, why don't we just read poems actually written by people, because there's plenty of good poets and poems out there. Um, so this is my concern. I've been calling this a crisis in computational creativity and really upsetting people who spend their entire careers in computer poetry. I do fear that um, if and when computer poetry gets out there, we'll realise that the poem, had it been written by a person, could have won an award, could have won the T.S. Eliot Award, fantastic poem. But because it wasn't written by a person, it isn't even a poem at all. Um, because I think um, certain things are so wrapped up in humanity um, that we'll have a hard time separating them. And I use the example of computational fingernails. Um, maybe a poem that is bizarre to think of uh, in computational terms as a fingernail. Um, we, we, we create fingernails, but they're so human-centric um, that um, the idea that software would make a fingernail is crazy. Um, and I think maybe, and, and this is a hypothesis, this is only anecdotally, but I think we need to uh, investigate this. This has led me, this is almost my last slide, um, it has led me to think about a new ending for this odyssey of conscious creativity, at least for me, um, which is that maybe the artifacts we produce will never be as appreciated, no matter how good they are, because of their computational origin. So producing cool stuff and entertaining people along the way in interesting ways isn't enough for me anymore in computational creativity research. Given that creativity in my mind is essentially contested, I think a more appropriate ending for this odyssey is to suffer itself to enter into the philosophical debate about creativity. Like today, I'd love my software to be on stage instead of me debating creativity with you um, because software will have this different perspective. Um, and it may well come to it um, through a computational perspective. I think the generation of artifacts like poems and games and so forth will be required to convey its entry into the philosophical debate. We kind of hope that the people discussing creativity are at least a bit creative, um, and maybe poetry will be prominent there. Um, who doesn't love a philosopher who can write poetry as well? Um, so that is a really nice new ending for me, which is coming from this mini crisis that I'm having in computational creativity. Um, the question from today is, slightly changed from the one given earlier. What, if anything, is holding people back from projecting notions of creative terms of software? And is it authenticity, as we saw with the Morris and Maureen Q. Smith poem? Uh, and so I'll be very interested in discussing with you after this talk and, and uh, this afternoon. And I'll finish there.